Hit it. It's July 10th, 2020, episode 88. I'm Patrick Serezna. And I'm Kevin Muir. This week, we interviewed the legendary Tony Beck, founder of the famous bank credit analyst and now part of the Alpine Macro team. Tony shares stories from nearly half a century in the markets. My favorite part, Tony tells the tale of when he was working at the Bank of Canada in the early 1960s, and they wondered, what's wrong with a little inflation? Then we talk charts with everyone's favorite dark arts wizard, my partner and technical analyst, Patrick Serezna. Then in This Week in Trading History, we discuss one of the biggest marketing blunders in consumer history. We get Taylor on to share our WTF clip of the week and then cap it all off with the top three things to watch next week. And well, Kev, we might even drink some beers along the way, right? And so stick around. We've got a great show. Let's get to our first interview. When I was a young high school kid with dreams of being the next Soros, I read all the research I could lay my hands on. I was fortunate enough to have a father who was the head of research at a Canadian brokerage firm, and they subscribed to the bank credit analyst. To say I was enthralled by this publication would be an understatement. I gobbled it up and pondered over all the reports with a wide-eyed wonderment that is usually reserved for other, mm, other types of magazines. But that's how much I love the bank credit analyst. A few years ago, a fellow reached out saying he had been reading my Macro Tours newsletter and would love to meet the next time he was in Toronto. He introduced himself as Tony Beck, the founder of Bank Credit Analyst. To me, this was like meeting one of my heroes. They say you shouldn't meet your heroes, but that adage didn't work with Tony. He is a terrific person, and I have had the privilege of getting him to know him a little better over the past few years. His extensive career in the financial industry gives him an ability to put many of the current economic situations in a unique historical context. It is my privilege to present to the huddle, Tony Beck. Tony, welcome to the show. Oh. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin, and I really appreciate you uh, inviting me. You know, I've been reading your stuff for for quite a while, and I must say, uh, if I can give you a plug here, if you don't mind, I just think you're one of the most creative, uh, interesting people out there, and uh, you always come up with uh, outside the box interesting ideas, and uh, they really stimulate the uh, uh, the mind. You know, that's and that's a big part of what the, of this game is uh, creating insights, and you're good at that. Well, that, that's, that's very kind of you to say, Tony. So without further ado, let's get into it. Let's learn a little bit about Tony and, you know, how you came about the bank credit analyst, what you've been doing since then, and, uh, you know, all about your current uh, endeavor, Alpine Macro. So where did it start? Do you know, are you, uh, how did you get into finance? Okay, well, yeah, how it started is um, I, I grew up in Toronto, went to University of Toronto and was in commerce and finance and uh in my last year, I had a, a course in, in uh, money and banking, central banking, Ed Newfeld, who wrote, wrote a book about it. And uh, I didn't want to go into business, and I didn't want to go into government. And so I figured, you know, the Bank of Canada is kind of somewhere in between. So uh, I applied and got a job at the Bank of Canada. And uh, particularly, it was, I mean, it was just like serendipity chance. And uh, I had four terrific years there. Uh, I felt totally out of my depth, all these brilliant PhD guys wandering around, and um, but I, I learned some really really interesting things uh, there. I mean, I, I, I just mentioned three of them, but uh, um, I learned how central bankers think, and I don't think it's very much different now. But they're very good at telling you what's already happened, uh, but they're not so so good at telling you what's going to happen in the future. And they're very right. risk averse people, and um, I don't think it's changed a whole lot since then. That's my my sense. Uh, they're very risk averse kind of people. Um, and interesting, uh, Steve Polos. Uh, we, we hired him for a while, and uh, he's a terrific guy. You probably know him. Uh, I'm sure some of your you know, your readers do. Steve's a really good guy, very smart guy. And he started off with us very much like a central banker, like um, you know, telling us what what had already happened. And by the time he left, he we sort of beat into him. But you know, the markets want to know what's going to happen in the future, and I think that really had an impact on him because I think he was a terrific governor. He really did a good job, and much more so than you know most other central bankers. He really wanted to try to figure out you know what was important for the future. Um, the second thing I learned having lunch with all these um, smart guys, the whole discussion then in the early '60s was all about kind of what's wrong with a little bit of inflation. And that really kind of rings a bell now, and especially with all this MMT stuff that's got really hot. Um, and it really stuck in my head, and, and that sort of paved the way for the inflation of the 70s. 
And the third thing was that nobody had anything for me to do when I got there. So I just kind of went to the library and I just read everything I get my hands on. And at that point, the uh, gold exchange standard was starting to unravel and uh, the U.S. was losing gold and Bretton Woods was kind of in the process of breaking down. And it was kind of a slow motion breakdown. And I really got hooked into this stuff and I really bought the story. It was uh, Jacques Rueff and Triffin and uh, it was a replay of the late 1920s. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, so that did me in good stead because when I joined the BCA, um, which was in 1968, I guess, uh, I really was onto this um, breakdown of the Bretton Woods and the collapse and the, the coming collapse in the dollar and the wage and price controls they put on. And the message from that was, you know, we're not going to stop reflating. We're going to control it with wage and price controls. We're not going to have a trade on policy. And that was the background to the inflation of the 1970s. And, uh, and I think that's what really made the uh, BCA. We were on that, uh, you know, really before anybody else in big time. And it was just, to me, such an obvious thing. And nobody else was sort of looking at that that sort of stuff. Um, so. Tony, so can that, I jump in here? So you're, you're, yeah, a yeah, sure. guy at, you're a young guy at the Bank of Canada, and you're you're going and you're learning all these things on your own. What what was the impetus? Like, where did that desire come from? Well, I just started reading everything to get my hands on, and then there's this big debate broke out in 1961, 62, between uh, uh, Triffin, and I've forgotten who the other guy was, but it was all about how to fix the gold exchange standard because it was going to come apart like it did in the late 1920s. So I got involved in that debate and I read everything and I said, this thing's going to happen again. It's going to blow up and uh, we're going to have, uh, you know, a big problem with the dollar and, you know, et cetera. So, um, you know, I just got into it. And, and then I used to talk to people at lunch. I remember this so well. And I started talking about gold and they'd look at me like, who let this guy in here? You know, this is funny. Let's say. <laughs> No, nobody talks about gold. Uh, they're all Keynesians, you know. And, um, I mean, even uh, Milton Friedman and monetarism was sort of a taboo subject around the bank then. So, I mean, things have, you talk about how things have changed. That's one thing that's really, really changed big time. And uh, the, other, the, the other thing – oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Go, you keep going. I'd love to hear the stories. Oh, okay. So, you're, you, you know, you're asking me about some of the things that uh, – uh, you know, have changed and haven't changed. And uh, so the whole, the whole bank credit analyst approach was all about liquidity. Um, you know, that was Ham Bolton, the guy that started Bolton Trombley and, and wrote this plant letter. And uh, so I really got into liquidity. And the big thing that he always made a point of is you look at the asset side of the banks if you want to know what's going on. You don't look at the liability side. And it makes a difference if money supply is increasing because banks are making loans, or is it increasing because banks are um, can't make any loans because business is depressed and they're buying securities? It makes all the difference in the world. So, uh, so I really got into this liquidity stuff. I got a you know a couple of stories for you. Then, as you probably remember, at the end of the seventies, the big inflation, and then Volcker, Paul Volcker came in and he gave the economy a, a cold bath, and interest rates went through the roof, and uh, and nobody was prepared for this. So one of the things that happened is uh, we had a client, a consulting client in Miami. It was a Miami, Miami savings and loan. And uh, the guy asked me down there, he said, you know, could you help us out? we got a problem because, uh, you know, there was still regulation queue then. So banks were limited on what they could pay for their CDs. Right. And, uh, he said, you know, we got a problem. All our CDs are running off and you know, interest rates are like, uh, we got all these fixed rate mortgages for 30 years at 6%. And, uh, so I said, well, you're sort of screwed, I think, um, because <laughs> it's going to go up to 18% and you got all these, these, these mortgages at six. So uh, I had this young guy with me. So we were taking this taxi uh, out to the airport when I left and we were talking all the way out. And I was pointing out to this young guy. I said, uh, you know, you see what's going to happen and they're going to go bust. And uh, so the guy, the taxi driver dropped us off and then he opened the window and he said, uh, Guys, um, I got all my money with the Miami, I think Miami Savings and Loans. Do you think I should take it out? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was really worried about starting a run on the bank, but anyway, I told him you should get his money out. <laughs> Don't say you were talking to him. <laughs> so that was so fun. Another, and another story I really, like, I remember so well about this. It was in the late 70s, and we had 
uh, Bankers Trust that doesn't exist now. It got merged away, but um, uh, the uh, investment department were, were big clients, and, and they kept saying, you know, you keep talking about this liquidity, and it's, you know, I think there's going to be a problem, and because uh, we were writing about how the banks got it, were getting illiquid then. So we said, would you mind coming to a, talk to our senior management? So I said, sure, you know, no problem. So, so I go there and have a meeting with the, all the like the top guys, the CEO and the, you know, the chief operating, all these, all these guys were there. So I had to lay out my story and I had all these charts about uh, bank liquidity and it was been collapsing. And finally, the CEO, he couldn't take it anymore. And he just turned to me like with this pained look on his face. And he said, look, Sonny, you don't understand a thing. Liquidity is what we can borrow. <laughs> That's so I said, oh, really? Oh, really? really? <laughs> so anyway, and then there was a big banking crisis that took place later. But I mean, I'm just mentioning that because, I mean, so few people saw this coming. That's how the world was really changing then. Right. So, so uh, listen, you, anyway, so you're at the... So let's go back to, you, you know, your, your timeline of your career. You're at the Bank of Canada, and then you decide that uh, this isn't for you. And it, what was it uh, just you got fed up of the government kind of bureaucracy? And, and where do you go from there, and how do you eventually get to bank credit anal- analyst? Yeah, I guess I, I just got restless. I couldn't see myself staying there. And, and the, uh, you know, and the environment, it was you know, all about you know, uh, research and um, bureaucracy and uh, – Kind of the thinking, it was very sort of an academic kind of thing, and I thought, no, I don't, you know, I don't really want to do this. Right. So I just decided to leave and, and, and learn something about economics. I, I still, I had no idea what I wanted to do. In fact, I never did. I still don't. Um, <laughs> still, <laughs> You're going to figure it out one of these and, days, eh, Tony. You're going to figure it yeah. out one of these days. Yeah. <laughs> so you you, so, you, you uh, take off and you go back to back to university, right? You get your finance degree from Wharton. Yeah. Yeah, so I went to Horton. I did, a, did my doctorate there, and, uh, and I had some really good teachers. That was a was a really good experience. And uh, but I decided I didn't want to do uh, didn't want to be an academic, and um, it's too kind of slow moving for me. And then this opportunity came up with the uh, Hammy Bolton. Uh, it started Bolton Trombley, and the BCA was an investment letter. Then he he died suddenly of a heart attack, so this opportunity popped up, and so I grabbed it and, and uh, came to Montreal. That, and, so uh, that, so you you told me earlier that you were in Montreal for Expo sixty seven. What if you hadn't gone to Expo, would you have a credit analyst not exist? I have no idea. I don't know what would have happened. <laughs> um, I, I don't think it was mar- it was marketable, and I don't know what I would have done. I, I, I'm sure I would have done something different. So who knows? <laughs> but I mean, that's, that's life. Right. You, know, life you, so, you know, you go along a road, you come to a come to a. Across the crossroads, and you take it, and you never know where you're going. So I'm a, right. you know, so, well, and we come back to that later. But you want to me to talk, talk about some of the things I could pass on to other people. But so For yeah. Sure. Were, um, yeah. So you're in Montreal. You go and you start bank credit analysts. It just starts you and another like it's a small shop, right? It's just the two of you, like you and yeah, an assistant. You know, yeah, yeah, woman drawing charts, and it was it. And, and so you take that you take that in 1967, and over the next uh, kind of couple of decades, you turn it into a, a large organization, one of the kind of I would argue one of the biggest macro research shops in in the world. Would you say? Yeah, I guess not, if you're not counting the banks, I guess yeah, independent. Uh, but yeah, it was over 30 years, and uh, I sold it in 2000, and uh, it just kind of grew. And well, it kind of grew out of hand, got out of hand, and. Uh, um, and it really got got hot, and, and I think just going back to what I was saying earlier, what really made us was we we got the seventies right, and nobody else really saw this coming. That's one of those examples of what I gave you with the that savings and loan and the bankers trust. So, you know, that I used to hear all the time. Everybody's walking around with a copy of the bank credit analyst under their arm, and I thought this is kind of like a must read sort of thing. And uh, right. so that's things just kept kept going, you know, from there. Let's talk a little bit about that era and uh, what it was like. So you've you've mentioned kind of the late seventies when goal, you know inflation was taking off. Talk to us about the early eighties when interest rates were really spiking, and maybe about the environment that was, uh, you know, people's attitudes about inflation. Um, well, that was it was um, a really interesting period because that's when Volcker came in, and uh, he was determined to, to stop inflation. And so 
one of the things I really had trouble adjusting to after that was I got so hooked on um, irresponsible governments and irresponsible spending and a Federal Reserve that uh, doesn't know what they're doing. And um, so I thought this uh, was a bear market rally for for, um, for capitalism and uh, <laughs> for the for the, you know for getting inflation under control. And I thought it was going to come back again. And what happened was, um, you know, money supply in the first half of the '80s really took off again. So I thought right. this is going to lead to more inflation, but it didn't. And the big lesson from that was, when you have a huge um, decline in inflation and a big hit to the economy, there's a big hole in there and you have to fill it with money. And it doesn't mean it's inflationary. It means that demand for money has really gone up. And that is totally relevant for today. When you've got this big hit to the economy and the Fed is pumping all this money into the system. It's not going into inflation. It's going into uh, filling the demand that people have for liquidity. You know, they right. want to save more, a whole more, you know, so it's very relevant for, for that. But I, I was late uh, getting that figured out. Um, you know, I really thought inflation was going to come back again. I just, and uh, it's hard, hard to adjust when you get really hooked on one thing and you've been right for a long time. It's hard to know when to kind of jump off the train. Well, and you weren't so, alone when it came to being late in terms of jumping off the train because there was some f- people that kept uh, predicting inflation all the way down, like uh, 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 Dr. Henry Kaufman at Solomon Brothers. He made his career right, out of right. that, and he never changed. Yeah. I think he's still waiting for inflation. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, and, I mean, that's true. There's a lot of people, uh, yeah. And, and, and uh, so what, who were some of the people that, – that actually saw it coming and understood that change and what were the, what was the attitude towards them when they started talking about this disinflation that we were going to experience? Um, do, you, do you remember? You know, one of the, yeah. I, Gary, um, what's his name? Gary Schilling is one of the guys that, that really got it right. And, um, I'm not sure how much was for the right reasons, but, uh, you know, we had the oil thing in the, in the seventies, which, uh, um, you know, with the cartel and that compounded everything. Um, it was more of a, a symptom of the inflation as a, rather than a cause that people mixed them up. But Gary Schilling afterwards said, you know, this cartel is going to break down. Um, and, uh, he's, he stayed on the deflationary side and he's, he manages money as well as writes a letter, and I, he's, I, I see him periodically. And he said, "You know, I've just been in the long bond for the last thirty years, and right. uh, that's been the right, the right thing." So I've got to say, Larry, uh, uh, Gary really, uh, really, you know, really has got it, got it right. Um, he was early on, and he stayed on it. He didn't give up on the trend. Yeah, and and of course, what happened was that uh, it wasn't just the fact that. Uh, um, you know, Volcker beaten inflation over the head, but then a whole bunch of other things began to happen too that compounded the deflation, like China opening up in the early 90s and uh, OPEC cartel breaking down because the price got too high and, uh, you know, globalization and the huge increase in productivity and, uh, you know, with China and the arbitraging low-wage countries with the U.S. So there's, you know, many other things that came in later that nobody would have foreseen in the early 1980s. So... So in some ways he was lucky, but uh, you know it's nice. Like, you can't get the right story. It's nice to be, you know be lucky get, and get it that way. <laughs> That's right. I, I always tell people it's uh, some people are. I uh, lucky enough to be born smart and others are smart enough to be born lucky. So let's continue on here. You're, you're, uh, you're, you're writing the bank credit analyst. 1987 comes along. What was that, that experience like? Why don't you talk to us about that? Yeah. Okay. So in many ways that sort of came out of the, the, the blue, there was the, uh, uh, the problem with the dollar and they were, uh, you know, the U S dollar was getting out of control on the downside. I think that was the trigger. Um, but the crash came just out of totally out of the blue. And I must say it, it really scared me. Um, and I guess I was thinking back to, to like a lot of people then who'd read their history in 1929, when the crash came out of the blue, it was just like, boom, the market's down 25% in one day. Um, you know, what's the message there? Is there a depression coming? And um, anyway, it turned out to be a hiccup, big one, big hiccup, but it was temporary because nothing fundamental had changed. The credit system didn't get broken. 
you know, the Fed eased up and, um, you know, things turned around. But, yeah, that was a pretty scary time. And then the next decade, we had increasing stock market exuberance, the famous irrational exuberance from uh, Greenspan in 96, and then the long-term capital and all these until it finally culminated in the bubble. And that was your last decade with bank credit analysts. What stories do you remember from that period? Well, in, in, in terms of the environment, the big the big thing was that, uh, and it's something that we were had been watching for decades, was this you know build up in debt, private debt, and the decline in liquidity, and we, you know we called it the, uh, the the debt super cycle. And what was happening was that you know the, the debt would build up, and then the Fed would hit it over the head, and uh, you know, it's the old, old joke, you know, the Fed, Fed kills every expansion sooner or later. And then the authorities would jump into the breach and the Fed would pump it up and the fiscal authorities would pump it up. And it really became pretty clear that, um, you know, the authorities were not were going to do, quote, whatever it takes to keep the game going because everything was getting so politicized that it was clear you couldn't get elected you know, as president if there was a recession on unemployment. So, uh, that became the, 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 the game. And so, uh, obviously, when people called it, I guess, the Greenspan put. Um, but it, um, it it led to the to the mania in the late 1990s, um, and then which got re, reignited again you know, after the 2000, 2002 recession. Um, but it was one of the more really interesting things that happened. Uh, maybe I'm not quite answering your question. Uh, the way you posed it, but in 1998, you know, there, clearly there were strong signs of a bubble, and then um, you had the emerging markets crisis, which lasted I don't know about a year, and the long-term capital blow up, and then the Fed responded as they always do; they just poured money out of the system, and then the market took off again. And I think the Nasdaq, uh, I'm not sure exactly the numbers, but I think it doubled in a year after that long-term in 1999. Right. And the numbers just got crazy in terms of valuation, and so that was the, you know, the game. And uh, then, and then it broke, um, you know, with the recession. And then the thing that's really interesting after that, you had the rotation into small cap value stocks, and uh, we were fortunate we were a big beneficiary of that because I was terrified. I thought, you know, with the S and P at thirty five times earnings, whatever, when it goes down, it's going to take. Uh, take everything with it and um, um, but it was all the you know small cap value stuff went up all the way through from 2000 2002 all the way up to 2007 so there was you know a big a big uh, a big change there, which also has a shift yeah which has implications for today if, you know if we come around to that later we can talk about that but uh, uh, in terms of I think you asked me who was sort of on to that in the 90s and I you know, I can't, no, no names really, uh, really yeah, come no, to mind. Listen, so so 2000 comes wrong, and you the bubble's about to burst, and you, with fortuitous timing, sell BCA. It's 100 people at this time. You decide to cash out. And yeah. so, what do you, so what do you do for the next uh, 20, year, 20 years? Why don't you walk us through these past couple of decades? Uh, well, that's a, an excellent question. And whenever somebody says it's an excellent question, I don't have a good answer. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I found things to do, and uh, I was glad to be free of the dead, you know, deadlines and stuff like that. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, we um, started up the foundation. I spent a lot of time on that. That was really fun. It was like a startup in a business, except it was a nonprofit, it was a foundation, and uh, we had a lot of motivation for it because a personal tragedy in the family and. Uh, uh, so it was really fun to see that grow. And I guess that's always sort of been me is I love to start things, right. but I'm not so good at, at managing them after they, <laughs> they get to the point where they need to be managed. You know, it's like, I, I like the creative uh, uh, part of it, but uh, I'm not, I'm not big on, you know, the process managing. and management and all that sort of stuff. That's not me. Well, showing that you truly are an entrepreneur in 2017, you started up Alpine macro. Why don't you tell us about that, uh, about your new shop and how it works and, uh, what you guys do. Sure. Uh, well, it came out of, um, uh, actually long, long discussions that, uh, Chen Zhao, uh, he's my partner. We started this together and I hired Chen in, uh, 1992 
when I started to get interested in, in China. And uh, Chen is amazing. He's absolutely uh, brilliant guy. On top of that, he's, you know, very funny, witty, creative. And um, I'd gone to China, China trip in 92, and I came back and I said, you know, we got to get involved. I don't know what we're going to do, but we got to get involved. This is obviously the future. <laughs> and uh, so I heard Chen. And uh, his product was the, uh, eventually it was called the Global Investment Strategy. It was about 25% of BCA's revenues. It was just like a huge success. And then he stayed on after I sold it. And then he left and he worked for um, a money manager for a couple of years. And he got really fed up with that, uh, doing marketing and so on. And Chen and I talked for years about trying to do something together. So the time was right. So we said, let's go for it. And uh, and put something out on, on LinkedIn that we're going to do this. And, and we just got a, an avalanche of CVs from uh, our old company. And uh, they were all wanting to come with us. They were all getting fed up. So we were able to cherry pick all the, the best people. Uh, we're now about 30 people. It's going really well. Uh, we get you know, two really good managers that take care of all the administration. So the editors can do their writing and the sales people can do their selling. And, uh, um, you know, it's, it's really just been a lot of fun. Well, that's and, terrific. Uh, so it's given me a new lease, lease on life. And, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that's it's, awesome. Uh, and I love, I always uh, love the market. So it's nice to be involved. And uh, I don't do very much writing, and I don't do much managing. But you know, I'm there to guide them and mentor, <laughs> and uh, you know, whatever. Uh, I get involved in meetings and research ideas and stuff like that. That sounds great. So you brought some charts with us today from your shop at Alpine Macro. Why don't we walk through them and tell us what you're sure. looking for in the markets and what you see out there? Okay. So, yeah, what sort of um, uh, triggered the, the idea for these charts is I figured sooner or later we'll get around to talking about modern monetary theory, MMT, which you, uh, over a year ago, you brought to, brought to my attention that uh, this is something we should pay attention to and um, I wrote something then. I've just written something again that will get published in a day or a few days. And um, so I think, that, you know, it's, that's really um, uh, interesting. And so I think the first thing I want to say is just like a, in terms of looking at it into the markets, because this all relates to the markets. But, um, you know, a lot of people now, they raise the question, uh, you know, how can the market be going up so much? And uh, it's risen so dramatically and the economy is still Pretty, pretty depressed. It's hardly recovered at all. I mean, isn't this crazy? Uh, but it, it's not really crazy because, uh, you know, we, we've got the, you know, the, the main ingredients for a classic, I think, a classic new bull market. Um, and, you know, what you need, you need a recession, you need a collapse in inflation, you need monumental new stimulus to come into the system, and you need excess savings. Um, and if you have all that, you've got huge liquidity looking for a home. And if this occurs when you've got a weak economy, but it's recovering, then people can start to feel more hopeful about future earnings. So that's exactly where we we are now. And uh, the first chart, uh, which is uh, you know shows the private sector saving surplus, is it shows you how much kind of excess capacity we have in the system. There's huge excess savings, so there's massive liquidity that's going into the system, and with interest rates at Last time I looked, the 10-year U.S. Treasury was something like 0.7 or 0.8. I don't know where it is now, but uh, and all virtually zero at the short end. I mean, people don't have places to put their money. So that's why I think we're in a new bull market. And uh, basically, we had a compressed recession, and I think we're seeing a compressed bull market now, which usually always happens. Um, so that's sort of the uh, kind of the backdrop to all this. So. I guess there are three three big questions that come out of that, and uh, you know how long is it going to last? And uh, uh, you know I think the Fed is not going to do anything for a very long time. They screwed up twice after the Great Financial Crash, uh, too early, it's got a bad reaction, and the reason is they were tightening when inflation was still way below the Fed targets, and the Fed was confusing. Uh, you know, the old uh, relationship between unemployment and inflation. And right. uh, the charts two and chart, the next two charts, uh, page page three, I think it is, they show that there's really been no relationship between unemployment and inflation for a long time. 
and uh, and the, the Fed has really really got that wrong. And so that's one of the things MMT people have really really got right. You know, there's a lot of lot of good stuff. You you've said that in the, in, your, in your writings. You know, there you know a fair bit of it makes pretty good economic sense. Right. Some so of the now we makes- got. Sorry, some of the plumbing in terms of how they describe how the system works is actually quite correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, then, so there's a big question: How long is this bull, bull run going to last? And I don't know, but a lot of it is going to depend on how long do we have this excess capacity in the system, and how long will it take to close the gap between actual and potential output? That's the, uh, you know, the the big gap, and this is where MMT comes in, and, and COVID, the virus, and the election, because you know we can all see the polls now that Biden is way ahead. If things stay the way they are, he's likely to be the next president. So the question is, how far left is he? Is he going to go? And you put me on to uh, Stephanie Keaton's book, which I read carefully, and, it, and it's a, it's a really good book if you want to understand what MMT is all about. And uh, uh, and she advised Bernie Sanders. Uh, right. So the big right. so MMT has really got hot now, and uh, and her timing is terrific. So we've got this situation where we've got this massive excess capacity, and the MMT people basically say that when you get all this slack in the system, um, you can fill the hole by creating a whole bunch of new programs, and um, and you can close the output gap and. Uh, um, you know, it's a free lunch. Even though in her book she keeps saying, you know, uh, I understand it's, uh, it's not that this is not about a free lunch, but basically she is saying that it's a free lunch as long as the economy is depressed and it's way below, you know, its potential. You can you can pump it up with fiscal policy and you don't have to worry about inflation. You can, you can right. close that output gap. And uh, so the next four charts, they're on, uh, I guess, page four and uh, – page four and five and so it shows the federal uh, budget balance which you know has opened up dramatically with the collapse in the economy back in, in March April and you know the MMT say that when well, you can really fill that hole and there's no problem with inflation so the timing is is fantastic for you know people that want to believe in, in MMT so the question is what you know where are the risks in this? And so one would be if the MMT people get their hands on the on the driver's wheel, assuming Biden gets elected, and how far left are they going to go? Is uh, Stephanie Keaton going to be, you know, an advisor? Is uh, you know, is uh, Biden going to have to appeal to Bernie Sanders' base to get elected, or does he feel he has to, you know, try to get his uh, uh, his, his his base on side? So how long would the output gap last? Maybe it'll get closed a lot faster. Rates will go up sooner than people think, and inflation. And then the other risk is, is uh, you know, tax increases. And uh, he said he's gonna, the first thing he's going to do is repeal Trump's tax cut. Well, Trump's tax cuts were good for the stock market, so if you repeal them, uh, it's obviously not good for the market. And right. the other thing I worry about too is that this MMT. It's really all about redistribution of wealth. It's uh, not about wealth creation. And uh, wealth creation comes from productivity increases. And when I looked through her book and I read other MMT stuff, I don't see uh, those people talking about productivity, like how to increase productivity, which ultimately is the source of, of wealth. So those are, you know, three risks that, uh, you know, concern me uh, out right. there. And then the third risk I don't know if you want to step in here, or I can give you. Yeah, my no, third, actually, uh, can, can, uh, no. Finish up with your third, and then I'll and then I'll I'll give you some questions. Okay, so the third one has got to do with uh, valuation. You know, are we in a mania now? And um, there's a lot of things that look like it. And uh, there's two charts. Two charts on page six that uh, show signs of uh, pretty extreme uh, market behavior. You know, there's um, the standard for uh, uh, information technology in NASDAQ as a percent of market cap and comparing with the late 1990s. And then also, if you look at the uh, growth stock PE ratio um, you know, over the same period. And 
you know, this obviously give uh, you know one uh, a bit of a jolt and wondering what uh, what's going to happen out there. Um, the one thing I've learned over time is that valuation it doesn't really help you much with timing. You know, things can get overvalued and they can stay overvalued for a very long time. It's really all about risk, and uh, so there's, clearly there's there's a lot of risk out there. If some of these negative things that I, I just talked about, if some of them come into come into play, right. um, and I guess the third thing is, like when I look back at 2000, 2007 period, you know, quite often after a bear market, you get rotation into the sectors that lag behind, right. but it doesn't seem to be happening yet. Um, but we're sort of feeling that will happen at some point as the stuff that's overvalued gets increasingly, uh, you know out of touch with reality that I would think money will start to go into what's like behind, but uh, it doesn't, doesn't happen yet. But, you know, that would be more kind of industrial materials, uh, uh, financial back stocks, uh, small cap value, that sort of thing. So uh, anyway, okay, I don't know so what's going to happen. Yeah. That's what I would be watching for. Yeah. So I have some questions for you, Tony. Um, let's start with the central banks and their abandonment of the Phillips curve, meaning the between inflation and unemployment. Do you uh-huh. do you think that uh, that this is something that they've consciously made a decision doesn't work anymore, or do you think it's it's uh, they've just the the times have foisted that op- you know opinion on them because they unfortunately have to uh, it's just, it's just the reality of the new financial order. Uh, well, it is a you know a new, new new part of the financial order, and it is a mystery to a lot of people. Like, how can unemployment drop as low as it did? You know, before the crash, right? The COVID crash, um, without causing inflation, and there's a number of explanations. None of them are really all that that good. But Ed was paying weight uh, to uh, unemployment. You know, it's all part of their discussions and their meetings. And I think behind it all was the fear of the, of the spiraling government debt and deficits after the the bailout from the great financial crash. You know, the Fed blew up their balance sheet and, uh, you know, the fiscal policy poured in, you know, trillions of dollars. So I think they had this sense that, We've got to start to unwind all that government debt on our balance sheet, and that and that's that that's that's dumb. That's 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 stu- stupid. And you know the evidence has shown that, um, like in Japan, for example, if you got a lot of slack in the system, um, you can have high government debt and big deficits, and it's not inflationary. In fact, it's probably the right the right policy. And that's the other thing that the MMT people really have got right is that. Um, you know, with a lot of slack in the system, you don't worry about the deficits and the debt and don't try to focus monetary policy on unemployment because you're going to get it wrong. Do, do you think that when Powell came, one of the one of my contentions is that he was worried about another financial market bubble and he, he was there for the cleaning up of the 2008 bubble and uh, I, I get the sense that he was his kind of attitude was not again under my watch. And then when he came, he purposely tried to, uh, let's just say, tame the animal spirits. Do you get the sense yeah. that he was the, the do you agree with that, first of all? And then second of all, do you think he was the last central bank to ever do that? Central banker. OK, those good, good, good questions. Yeah, I think that was on his mind. And it goes back to the 80s, you know, with Greenspan. Greenspan. And, uh, you know, Greenspan, remember he talked about, um, uh, how did he Irrational. put it, uh, rational uh, exuberance? exuberance, yep. And, and then, he, then he backed away from it, and he just let the thing rip. And his idea was, well, you know, there's nothing we can do about it, so let it blow itself out, and then we'll pick up the pieces after. Well, you know, after it blew apart in uh, 2009, there were quite a few pieces to, to pick up. And uh, so I'm sure that was also in Powell's mind. So it was a combination of, you know, are we going to have another uh, bubble? Are we going to, you know, what are we going to do about all this debt and our bloated balance sheet and unemployment? We're going to get inflation and all these things. And, you know, it's not a good time to be a central banker because it's very hard to know how to play that. And, you know, ever since, you know, Greenspan's bubble and the bursting, it's it's been a hot topic among people. that should central bankers target um the stock market or should they just target inflation 
or like you know what what should they they target and um that's that's pretty tough if you're a central banker and you're like watching what's going on now but you've got all this unemployment and a very depressed economy you're going to say oh yeah i'm going to jack up rates now because i don't like the smell of this bubble and then the thing blows up <laughs> i don't think any central banker is going to do that so it's sort of like the devil you do and the devil you don't so do you and, think that uh, if we were if we were to get a, a a really strong rebound like let's imagine tomorrow that there was a vaccine that they could get out by Christmas time and the economy just started ripping. How slow do you think the Fed's going to be, or not just the Fed, all central bankers, in terms of raising rates? I would think they'll be um, pretty slow to raise rates because my sense is they're probably going to target inflation more directly, and it's still pretty low. So even if they announce a, a you know, a, the vaccine and the economy started to move a lot faster, you know, to get ahead. But I, I don't think that's going to happen. But you know, if it did, um, I th- still think they'd be pretty cautious about raising rates. Um, you know, given their experience uh, after the uh, Great Financial Crisis, when they were tightened prematurely twice. So central bankers are famous for trying to fight the last battle, and that's probably very much in Powell's mind: is uh, don't do that again. No, right. I would so, think um, they, they would. I think they'll lag, lag behind. And, and well, if you remember back to Greenspan, or not sorry, Greenspan Bernanke, in 2010, we had a, a, a brief blip when inflation went over two percent. And I remember everyone was screaming bloody murder, saying you got to raise rates, you got to stop with this the QE. And he said it's temporary, it's yeah. temporary, it's temporary. And he proved correct. Now, do you think that if we had that same sort of spike higher, 3 4%, Powell's going to have the fortitude to say it's temporary and to push back? Um, I would guess so. I, I don't see it going to 3 or 4%, but, uh, you know, let's say it even went to 2%, the Fed's targets. I don't think they're gonna, they, they would do anything because they've been so far below their targets for so long. And, you know, part of the central bank conversation is should we be targeting more the price level and allow some catch up, or should we be just looking at the current rate of inflation? And you could have a fair bit of catch up before it was really, uh, I think, felt felt to be important to, to to focus on inflation directly, unless the number got bad. I mean, if you went to three or four and it was across the board, um, you know, then that's a, that's a different story. But I really don't see that happening anytime soon. Do you think we're going to get a nominal GDP targeting from the from uh, central bankers? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I can't answer. I mean, it, it, in some ways, it makes makes sense, but um, is this that, targeting inflation? Maybe it's it not enough, but, <laughs> but uh, it makes sense. Yeah. So that rules it out. Uh, <laughs> So what do you so you know you're you're talking about this the stock market and how it could keep going up it's the makings of a of a the start of a bull market is is that where you're advocating people put money right now and that you can't be long bonds and that really what you need to do is go out and even though it seems stretched you have to buy risk assets Yeah I well yeah I I don't think you know bonds are a good place to be other than for safety you know treasury bonds and, you know, so there's some people, you know, who are really still, still pretty bearish. They say, oh, the rally's a fake out rally. It's a bear market rally, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, I think in bonds, corporate bonds, if you're good at credit analysis, there's, uh, you know, people tell me, I'm not in that business, but people tell me there's some pretty good opportunities in, uh, in credit where a lot of bonds got uh, sold, oversold relative to, you know, the, the credit uh so I think that's right. a place. But I think the longer term, the stock market is is, is is good. But I think you want to focus on you know good companies that are properly valued. If you can't find them, I don't think you want to be playing. And also, I I really think it's a good time to be pretty cautious because I don't know how things are going to play out. I mean, this really is a, a pretty wild world we're in. And uh, you know, who's ever seen anything like this before? So. Yeah. There's got to be some risk out there. So I think it's one thing if you want to speculate and roll the dice and uh, figure you can get out in time. But, you know, for a long-term investor, um, and it also depends what kind of investor. If you're an institution, you're being evaluated on your quarterly performance, you know, you've got uh, 
career risk as uh, you know as much as anything. So it's pretty hard to be out. But if you're say a family office and that's your own money, and you have enough money, you could say you know I don't really have to play this thing to the hilt. You know, I'll play it right. with. Uh, take some money off the table and I'll still have some, some cards in the game. And if it keeps going up, then I'll benefit, but, uh, I'm okay. If, uh, if something, another, one of the uh, things, sorry, yeah, sorry, Tony, what, one of the things that I find, uh, funny and I haven't seen as many cycles as you, but I was wondering if you could comment about this. I find people tell me, Oh, if I was only around in the dot com bubble, I would have made so much money. And then these same people are there in today's market and the market's exploding higher and all they're doing is shorting it. And I'm like, no, you wouldn't have made so much money in the dot-com bubble because it was just, <laughs> as, it was just as difficult to buy in the dot-com bubble as it is to buy today. And yeah. you've seen a lot of these cycles. Is this just the nature of, uh, of stock markets is that they climb a wall of worry and that the reality is that it's always tough to buy? I, <laughs> I think that's... That's uh, that's generally true. If you're feeling like really, really confident, and you really want to be going flat out, you know, it really should be doing the opposite. That you should scare yourself, um, and it it it's really hard to go in there when uh, when there's blood in the street or um, right. You know, uh, but that's really well. I guess I'm mean, gonna go back. The right thing to do, which very few people do is to have a proper asset allocation framework so that um, say you want to have 60% in stocks and you're in a mania. So suddenly the 60 is looking like you're 80% in stocks where you start selling and take it back down to 60. And uh, you know, this way you over time, you balance out your risks and you're going to end up doing a lot better, but very few people have that discipline. And then, you know, greed is always alive and well. Up, people are you know looking at the rearview mirror and they're saying, you know, I wish I'd done this, I wish I'd done that, and all their friends are telling us what stocks to buy and how much money they're making, and it's pretty hard to just to stay out. Uh, right. But you know, those are some of the class, classic, um, you know, uh, ring the bell sort of things is uh, when everybody's uh, telling you what to buy and how this thing is going to go on forever. You know, it's kind of be kind of be getting out. Yeah, so I, yeah, I guess so. I mean, what I'm saying is, I think there's a pretty good chance this bull market could extend. But that's why earlier, you know, I mentioned these risks. These are things to keep an eye on. So, uh, if, the, if the economy keeps rising but not too quickly, and um, you know, this, the Fed can ease back a little bit on the throttle, and we get some growth in here, um, you know, this could last for quite a while. But if, if, uh, if we get some violent movements, like your uh, uh, Economy, you know, we get a V-shaped recovery because there's a vaccine out there or whatever it is, and the thing takes off, then uh, it, the whole risk profile of the market's going to change quite a bit. And I think right. that's... So, Tony, I'd, I'd love to just, for the last topic here that we discuss, is to take it back to um, the early 60s. And you mentioned that when you were at the Bank of Canada, the, the prevailing attitude was, what's wrong with a little bit of inflation? I, I, I just I would love to kind of go through what the bankers were thinking at that time and how what the mentality was in the kind of in, in the in the idea that maybe we're experiencing the same. And why don't you just talk to us about the similarities between the early 60s and today? OK, well, I think in the early 60s, I, I was pretty green then. I mean, it's, it's just out of school, undergraduate, I didn't know much about anything. And uh, but I heard all these guys talk, to, like the, the senior guys talking. And I think uh, this is, this, you know, not that far away from the depression. And there was a lot of slack in the system too in the uh, late fifties, early sixties, which seems crazy compared to now, but there was. So that that was sort of the attitude. They were all Keynesians, and right. you know, MMT is basically kind of a Keynesian concept. It's, uh, you know, based on aggregate supply, aggregate demand, aggregate uh, savings and figure that aggregate demand will let you raise aggregate demand. And uh, and if you get a little bit of inflation, then, you know, where's the problem? As long as it, you know, you sort of get some balance. That was really the attitude. And I think uh, nobody had any experience at the banks and seeing the people with inflation. They were just as caught off guard as 
you know, everybody in the private sector and those institutions I was talking about earlier, it uh, it just wasn't on their on their radar screen. And, um, so and, I, and I think they, and they and they purposely yeah. went and pursued stimulative policies because they thought that the inflation would be controlled and that it was a little bit of inflation was, was something that would be beneficial to the economy. So uh, it was sort of the, I think the most important was the mindset. The mindset was, you know, you could really stimulate quite a bit and don't really worry about inflation because it's not a problem. And, um, and that's why central banks were overly easy all through the through the 1960s, and uh, so the inflation had a, a long base period to build up, and that's why you know when uh, uh, the Bretton Woods Agreement came apart, you know Nixon uh, uh, floated gold, floated the dollar against gold, um, you know inflation was just ready to take off. And all that liquidity was there, and then the dollar collapsed, and you had this whole interaction between. You know, the falling dollar, uh, rising inflation. And interestingly, the Fed, it's part of maybe the same thing, but the Fed and the other central banks, they lagged behind all the way because they kept saying, oh, we're raising interest rates, you know, we're tightening policy. Well, you know, you're not tightening policy if inflation is rising faster than interest rates are going up. And they right. never got ahead of the curve until Volcker took over and decided to give the economy a cold bath and put rates way over the rate of inflation. Okay. Well, it, it definitely sounds, it sounds sim- similar to what we're experiencing today when the MMTers tell us that there's gonna, no chance of inflation, and even if we get a little bit of inflation, what's, what's the harm in that? So listen, before right. we let you go, I have a couple of quick questions for you. You're a Toronto boy that moved to Montreal, and you've stayed there. Which hockey team do you root for? Uh, well, I guess I've always been a, a Maple Leafs fan. Um, <laughs> I used to go to the I used to go to the games. My grandfather had uh, uh, season tickets to Third World Blues just behind the uh, the bench. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, that that was great. I don't follow hockey so closely now, but uh, I went to a lot of a lot of games when I was uh, young. It's always like the Leafs. Uh, <laughs> they were they were they were terrific. And uh, did you, you're a Toronto boy, you probably took a little bit of French in in, uh, in high school or grade school. Did you pick it up in Montreal? Well, not really. First of all, I have a very bad ear. For, okay. Like, people that are good at music, usually they got a good ear for languages. And uh, my mother got me a piano teacher when I was six or seven, and the teacher quit after the fourth lesson. <laughs> she, said, <laughs> she said, this is absolutely hopeless. Uh, so I'm a French the French teachers I had at school, I went to Upper Canada College, and I didn't have a French teacher, not once, that was French. They were all English teachers that happened to teach French. So they taught it like it was Latin, like you memorized uh, vocabulary and grammar and stuff, but you never spoke it. So I never really could speak it very well. So anyway, I can get by, but I'm not, You're not, very, I'm good. not very good at it. Okay, so the last question for you. If you were to meet the young Tony uh, from, let's just say, half a century ago that was about to get into the finance industry, or, you know, you can, you can give this question in terms of whether you're giving advice about the finance industry or just life advice, what would you tell that young Tony? Uh, what, the first thing I'd say is if you like the financial markets, Get involved in the financial markets. There's nothing better in the world. They are so exciting. You got to know everything about everything, which, which you can't. Um, but they're always exciting. They're always interesting. It's, the game's always changing, and it's very, very rewarding if you turn out to be good at it. Um, so I would say that. But you know, the main thing is you got to follow your passion. And uh, in life, I mean, it's sort of a cliche, but you know, people that go into things that they don't have a passion for, it's never going to work out very well. And um, I think you've got to be lucky, and it's pretty hard to plan luck, but uh, you have to be open to luck. Um, for me, serendipity is uh, like a big thing. Like, I never had a game plan, what I want to do, where I want to go. You know, something would turn up, and I'd say, ah, oh, that's like a good idea, and i go for it. And uh, so often it came with a lot of risk, but I never even thought about the risk at that time, because when you're young, you can take a lot of risk. You know, if it doesn't work out, we try something else. So I would say for young people, when you're young, that's the time to take rest. So Tony's advice is to go for it. 
Tony, it's been a pleasure having you on. I just want to thank you for your time. It, it's been it's just been a wonderful experience to learn about your half a century in the markets. Okay, well, it's a bit of pleasure with being with you. So, thanks thanks for having me. Okay, youngins, <laughs> hop on. It's not just Lena this time. Taylor is joining us for some beers. Hey, hey. All right, so uh, Lena, what are we drinking? Today, we're drinking True History Brewing Company's Farmer in the Sky Pilsner. Oh, I gotta open it. So that's it? There's no description? Oh, what there is. Sorry. <laughs> I was busy opening this beer. I've been waiting to drink this beer. Um, yeah. Farmer in the Sky is a mm. twist on a classic, a traditional German pilsner dry hopped with citra. The result is an amazingly clean and refreshing beer. Notes of citrus, lemon peel, and fresh cut grass are balanced beautifully with a subtle bit on the finish. As always, keep cold, drink fresh. Yeah, it's, uh, it's nice. It's, got, uh, it's a very summery uh, drink, that's for sure. It's, uh, <laughs> Did they say it's, fresh, fresh cut grass? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, what was that I actually like it. So I, don't know what, I don't know what that says about the fresh cut grass. Maybe it's a different kind of grass. Well, I'm I'm really thirsty, so I'm gonna drink it. All right, we'll, so. we'll save our reviews for the end of the show. <laughs> All right, Kev, give a disclaimer, buddy. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in this show. Side effects of too much huddle may include the Fauci itch. The, I, I didn't say that right, did I? Fauci? I think it's Fauci. I'm going to leave it. It is Fa- Fauci. Fauci. There we go. We're just going to leave it in. We're not going to cut this. The Rushmore <laughs> butt rush and some FOMO-induced Netflix and no chill. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I Although I, I actually like three. these other ones that we had here, too. Gilead Giddies. That's a good one. And Boeing Burps. <laughs> it's on with the show. All right. Let's get to it, Patrick. What do you got for talking charts? Well, listen, uh, it's, it's been a really interesting market. There's, there's like this entire basket of stocks that have been running like stupid hot and a whole part of the market that isn't moving at all. And so I wanted to just kind of uh, take a little bit of a tour of, of what's going on here. This, I just start off here with the Spooz contract. Interesting as so far, there's, uh, the bulls have been able to keep this together. Every time we've had like these one day little sell offs this week, uh, the bulls just put it together and rally it right back toward the high. But the S and P is not where the action is, right? It, it's the NASDAQ and, and we'll talk about the fangs later on, but what, but really what we have is, um, a, a very specific part of the market that is, is being driven higher and, uh, and everyone's chasing the performance and, and running it. And this is, and this is really interesting because even if you look at the Dow Jones chart, the Dow has just not been able to even break those uh, mid-June highs. It's just uh, stuck in a sideways range. It, isn't that amazing how it's just that one sp- part of the market well, that's running? I don't want to give you too much uh, crap for looking at the Dow Jones, but it really is kind of an arbitrary 30 uh, stocks, Patrick. But it, I agree Well, I, was, I did that, start with the S&P, dude. Okay, well, let's talk about the S&P. The S&P, you're right, has not gone and broken to new highs. And when you compare the S&P to the NASDAQ, or even if you look at the, the small cap, or you go look at the Russell 2000, yeah. it's really sucking wind. Yeah. And uh, so what, what's interesting is, is that uh, a lot of this is coming. There's the Netflix um, uh, chart. Like you can see, it's just breaking out to the upside. The, the stock is just running super hot. And of course, there's Tesla. Right. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to stop and talk about Tesla because there's the big headline of all of this uh, uh, call open interest that is coming out there. And, and some are arguing that that's the it's being used to manipulate Tesla higher, because when you open up the like, I think there were the number was like there was like 2000 contracts opened at the two thousand dollar strike. Uh, with one week till expiration, like you, so, you, someone's throwing just under a million dollars at options that uh, have a very good chance of expiring, um, uh, worthless just in a week's time. Even if this thing runs three, four, five hundred bucks, it's still going to expire, right? So then, why do it? And uh, some argue that that they're doing it to force dealers to be buying uh, equity because they have gamma exposure and they're actually manipulating the stock price higher that way. What's your take on all that? Well, 
I don't know if manipulating is the right word, but there's no doubt that as these speculators come and they buy the all this gamma from the option market makers, the option market makers are short that gamma. So what does that mean? As Tesla rallies, they need to buy more stock, which becomes a self you know fulfilling kind of uh, uh, right. feedback loop. They they need to buy more, which then causes them to actually have to buy more. It's almost the what we experienced during the sell off of the Corona crisis when the when the dealers were all short reverse. gamma on the S and P and uh, the other stock indexes when they went lower they had to sell more and more and more. It's almost the reverse of that, and that's what we're right. experiencing. And you saw it when we had Tesla run what hundred dollars today on almost nothing, right? One of I the mean, things uh, that I, uh, what do you mean a hundred dollars? It went from fourteen hundred to one hundred fifty. One hundred fifty dollars. One of the things that actually I I would I'd like to address, Patrick, is I was curious of whether this was speculation that it was going to go into the S and P five hundred, and whether this was front running. So I went and did a little work and a little homework on this, trying to figure it out. So th- as far as I can tell, the uh, Tesla meets the market cap and liquidity requirements. But they actually have to be profitable for them to be added. And it looks like they have to have four quarters in a row where that uh, profitability uh, criteria is matched. And it looks like in July 22nd, when they announce if everything's fine and they're profitable, they potentially could be added at that time. And so what will happen is that they'll go on the list and they'll be the next one in line when someone else comes out for a merger or some other reason. And they'll go in and if if that does happen, guess how many shares the indexers will have to buy? I I don't I don't know. Well, a million, a million would be a lot. I agree. I think I would choose something like that. It's 25 million shares. Wow. Yeah. But the, the question then, I mean, is this not being already accounted for and they would be already front running that in terms of I, an anticipation? I'm not sure. I don't know if this is, if this is uh, front running of the S&P edition or not. I will tell you one thing, Patrick. If it does go in, that will be a sell the news event. Yes. And, and that, that's the interesting part when you said that, because I, I remember a number of these different stocks that did this. And often uh, it's all about the hype of it going in and then the, it's sell on news the moment it does. And so it would be really interesting if that starts to, to appear. What, what, what's interesting about this chart, let's go back to the technicals on Tesla, is you have, again, that same characteristic we've shared so many times on the huddle about the acceleration of the slope. And whenever you have an acceleration, it all, it, it's very rarely driven by fundamentals. It's often driven by liquidity and subsequently FOMO, where tr- traders are chasing performance and, and driving this higher. And very similar to what happened in February and March in Tesla after the, that la- last blow off, it mean reverts. And I'm not trying to say that that has to be the undoing and end of Musk and the company, but rarely do these kind of parabolic rises just stay up there. And so the question really is, is that in the, in the spirit of many of these liquidity moves, how high can they take it before it kind of uh, gets too high up in the stratosphere before and then the big mean reversion begins? You know, and I, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have thought we even got today's rally. I thought it was looking kind of it was looking like it was going to roll over um, yesterday, I thought. And then it just it, blasted off. You know, you know, the characteristic that I've been seeing technically on so many stocks that are working is the uh, 48 hour pause. What happens is that it's like if the stock does not begin some meaningful sell off within uh, within two days of it pausing, then the buy on dip traders just come back and just hammer it higher again. Uh, and, uh, and so we've seen these characteristics on so many other stocks as well. It's just like it pauses for two days and then off to the races again. And at this stage, like, who knows, like the, uh, on an hourly chart m- uh, measured move, you're talking easily 1800 on the upside, no matter how absurd I think it could be. I mean, this thing is just running on pure momentum, pure FOMO, everyone's chasing performance, and everyone wants a piece of the action. It's always fascinating to watch these charts, right? What, one of the things when I see this chart, Patrick, it reminds me of when you used to go look at the wheat charts or the corn charts from the 1970s when there was all these limit up moves and they just had these gaps that, that, 
they, so you would have a gap and it would just gap, gap, gap higher. And I look at this thing and I wonder, like, how, how are we getting gaps in a stock this big? But that's yeah. what it looks like. It just, it's, yeah. no, it's just taking off and it's, it's not even trading at those prices. And and I, back I, to the, you know that is the worst thing for back to the idea of of these market makers being short gamma, that is the thing that kills them, Patrick. Oh yeah, a big gap is is what you don't want because like because they can manage it while the market is open. You throw you throw right. a gap at them, they they're offside right off the bat and chasing, right? That's right. That's right. So and that's also why you I think a lot of these market makers trade it. it, it Round, I wouldn't say round the clock, but they'll they'll start at six o'clock in the morning, and so if you get a gap higher, they start pushing it higher as well. And there's nobody right. there. They're doing the pre market, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, let's talk some of these other hot stocks that have been moving. Uh, I wanted to touch on that Neo, like, uh, and again, one of these stocks where it was just boring, nothing going on when it was around two, three bucks, and suddenly. Uh, someone lit the match after its earnings there in May, and this thing hasn't looked back, ripping from a, a, being a couple bucks to up to like fifteen plus bucks on the upside. Like, what a move, right? This thing is is just got a well. It, it reminds you a lot of Tesla. Let's face it, and it, yeah. it's in the same it's in the same uh, uh, industry, and it's it's a Chinese version of Tesla, and it's just taking off, and it's running like you know it stole something. Yeah, and, it'll, and, be, and it, well, it'll be interesting if the lithium stocks will finally catch some tailwind on it. Uh, they they haven't really moved yet, but it, it clearly there's got to be some sort of uh, uh, knock on effect that if if there's enough attention going to these electrics, that uh, that you're gonna have some of these other periphery things start working, right? You'll have to get the uh, Robinhood traders to figure those out. Yeah, that that's that's too complex, right, for them. <laughs> Anyway, let's. Uh, what, what was interesting, you, we were also talking about that uh, recent SPAC that just um, the Spartan Energy that just uh, ripped. The, uh, what <laughs> what was a, that? So what? the Fisker, another car company, another electric car company, Fisker Automobile is rumored to be put into this, and this is a SPAC that was what ten and a half bucks, and it went from ten and a half bucks to eighteen and a half bucks in two days. Yeah, and this is just the type of environment that we're in when all you need is uh, that sort of announcement, and you have the the market cap doubling overnight. It's very reminiscent of 1998 and 1999. Yeah, and it, it was it is. just this is just it's becoming more and more. And I I remember back then it was you know the dot com bubble, meaning that you put dot com in your name, and later at the end of it it was like um, uh, what was it the L- Linux. You put Linux, it was Red Hat, or you just put your Linux, and they all took off. And there was different uh, different stages of it, but this is what it feels like. It, it feels like yeah. we're now going through the electric car stage of it, right? We yeah. had the Nikola, which is another electric. This one's well, a yeah, truck. This, this, what's interesting is that this is what I believe will happen to a lot of these bubble stocks. And again, it's not about the – everyone thinks it's about uh, us making a call on the company. The company's the company. The management's the management. It's long-term futures. It's long-term future. What we're talking about is the the price action of the liquidity, which is – it's like this bottleneck of buying that drives prices to the stratosphere. But there simply isn't enough buying interest at those higher levels to sustain it up there. And it almost always starts to mean revert when people want to take some profit profits off the table. And um, and you can see like after this thing blew off to 90 some odd dollars, it suddenly uh, mean reverted all the way back to 40. What is its true value? It's not even important. The, it's about the fact that this is the way the price always does it. And it's going to be really interesting with when, if some of these like um, Neos and all these other ones start to do similar type things. Like where is the big blow off and, and where's the mean reversion go afterwards, right? There's no doubt that a lot of the charts will look similar. The trouble is, is Neo going to go from 18 bucks to 40 before it does this? And that's the real difficult portion is to decide at yeah. what point that that's going to kick in. Well, and that, and that's the that's the greater fool theory that everyone's playing with greed right now, which is that they, everyone's chasing what's working, hoping that there's always a greater fool that will buy it at a higher price from them, and then no one wants to be the one stuck holding the bag. But uh, anyway, but that's, don't don't you know, Patrick? Stocks always go up. That's true. Uh, so uh, what a fool I am. Never mind. Uh, so um, 
Well, I wanted to move on. Uh, and we'll just touch on a couple other things. I mean, we already touched on Netflix, but what was interesting was the breakout in some of these retailers, particularly, I think Walmart uh, announced recently some sort of um, uh, um, a competitive product to Amazon Prime uh, for, for delivery and stuff. And the stock reacted incredibly well after consolidation. It'd be really interesting to see whether this catches a little bit of the Amazon tailwind with that announcement. I mean, it's right along those previous highs. Highs at, uh, just under that 130 to 135 zone where all those highs were coming in. If this breaks to a fresh high, I mean, we could maybe see Walmart gun for 140. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be interesting? It, it would. And, you know, one of the things you could think about is uh, sh- sh- um, doing this as a pairs trade against uh, Amazon. Yeah. That's you know, true. That Mrs. Bezos might be selling some stock in here to fund <laughs> some of her things. And, uh <laughs> Maybe, maybe Amazon will stop going. Well, up let's so let's take a look. Like Amazon, another uh, another one of these things that has just accelerated. Like, look at the rate of change of this final uh, advance here. Like, this is just going full on parabolic on the upside. It's amazing to see like this kind of. It makes it's a you, low float stock though, so I, it's easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Kevin, you make funny. Very nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to just leave it with Costco, though. And uh, interesting, I, I don't think they're competing with them on on that stuff. But it, Costco got, definitely got some tailwind. Uh, I don't know whether people are loading up on uh, more toilet paper for uh, wave two of the coronavirus. But uh, uh, but uh, the uh, breakout is there. I mean, it's it's toying with that 52 week uh, high or actually all time high breakout. So will it stick? And it's one of those make it or break it moments. Is that a prairie dog or is this a breakout? Because if it's a breakout. I mean, we could see another $20 on the upside of Costco if it can follow through. So it's going to be really interesting. So, Patrick, here, I'll make you do some tea leaf reading. I make you go long one of those three names, Amazon, Costco, or Walmart. Which one do you choose? Uh, actually, I'm already long Costco and Walmart with members at Big Pitch Trading. So, uh, so, okay. so I, you like I those two? So, I, I, so I'll be talking about, my book like Cuppy. No. <laughs> <laughs> which one? So which one do you like the best, Walmart or Costco? I, I, you know what? I, I have to say right now, uh, Walmart has a good story that might give it that extra uh, umph to the upside, right? And so that that will be interesting to see whether that is. So I, I, I'd have to. I'm guessing, but I would I would say if I, you were forcing me to choose one of the two, I would probably say Walmart. There you go. All right, okay. We'll see. All right. So anyway, let's uh, let's move on. So Patrick, it's time for this week in trading history. What do you have for us? Well, this week in trading history, I wanted to go back uh, to 1985 when uh, you were just a, a little wee kid, and I so was I. A little I. wee kid. Well, I wasn't that <laughs> little. Well, I was probably little, but I, as I said, I was. Well, you you, you were you were a teenager run, uh, riding your uh, ten speed bike in your parents. Uh, That's right. I was right? living in I was living in my parents' basement, listening to New Order albums. That's those were the good old days, weren't they, buddy? Yeah. They were, they were the good old days. <laughs> so the youth, so it, youth is wasted on the young. There you go. So it was, it was back on April twenty third in nineteen eighty five, where Coca Cola committed one of the biggest marketing blunders in consumer goods history when they announced that they were replacing the formula of the world's most popular soft drink. This new Coke rebrand would be the, the defining moment for Coca Cola Company. But Kev, what I would have personally thought the biggest marketing blunder was in 1903 when they removed the cocaine from the original recipe, right? (laughs) Imagine being a parent back then, like your kid goes from uh, cocaine to no cocaine. It's a, it's, it's, it's it's probably a lot like uh, going from uh, uh, today, like from iPad to no iPad for a kid, right? (laughs) But uh, so anyway, so uh, uh, here's some context. So back in 1985, the Dow was trading at 1278 the s&p 500 uh, traded at 182 and the average price of a new home was about eighty nine thousand. you gotta love inflation right it's uh, <laughs> no, but there is none patrick there is none no it doesn't exist so <laughs> coke coke at the time that was uh, considered a lethargic brand and it had been losing market share and uh and preference uh to pepsi for the prior 15 years uh, and Coke's executives were convinced that people were uh, driven to Pepsi for its taste. 
uh, and dismissed uh, credit for the very successful Pepsi generation ad campaigns that were running at the time. And through hundreds uh, uh, of thousands of taste tests, executives knew that the consumers preferred the taste of this new Coke to Pepsi. Uh, spoiler, they just made Coke sweeter, so it tasted more like Pepsi. Uh, and the, the CEO of Coke even said, they'll call this the boldest single marketing move in the history of packaged goods business. And so, but Kev, I would have thought, again, the boldest marketing move in history would be adding cocaine to the original recipe. But uh, no, no wonder uh, marketing was so simple back then. Like in, when you put narcotics into food, it basically sells itself, right? That's so like, 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 why would we stop at Coca-Cola? Why we could do like meth muffins and heroin hot dogs and LSD donuts and stuff like that, right? <laughs> anyway, so uh, and Kev, Kev. It's 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 more like junky food instead of junk food, right? Oh, anyway, oh, bad joke. Sorry. So, so anyway, Coke's president was uh, even quoted as saying he's uh, never been as confident about his decision as I, I am. Sorry, I'll rephrase that. Never, he's never been as confident about a decision as he was about the, uh, this one he's announcing today. So he, these guys were so convinced that this they were was all in. The, they were all in. Anyway. Those executives were obviously wrong. The news broke and the stock fell about 8% uh, over the next week that followed. And so people were pissed off. They felt betrayed uh, uh, that it was being taken away, even though they didn't really want it in the first place. But uh, 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 um, complaints and outrages were hur hurtled at uh, Coke's hotlines. Another person wrote to the CEO, addressing him as Chief Dodo, asking for his autograph because in the years to come, the signature of one of the dumbest exec executives in American business history would one day surely be worth a fortune. <laughs> but uh, what was crazy is people began hoarding original cans in their basement like, uh, like they, they're going out of stock. So like, think of the way people were hoarding toilet paper through COVID. People were hoarding, uh, like they were going and cleaning out shelves of grocery stores of, this, uh, of the old coke product because they were fearful that they, they'll never be able to find the stuff again so protest groups broke out even claiming that they've recruited hundreds of thousands of uh, people uh, uh, driving this big bring back old coke we, there were even songs written about it all over the internet like just talk about creating a buzz right so yeah. it was 79 days later where executives caved. It was on July, uh, It was in this week in trading history on July 11th of uh, 1985 when they announced they'd carry both new and classic Coke, uh, which made front page news. And Coke got tons of free press, and the brand engagement uh, was huge. And within a few months, Coca-Cola Classic quickly outsold New Coke, and then overtook Pepsi. And over the next uh, two years, the stock just ripped over 110 percent to the upside. Uh, the the so fiasco. Sorry, go oh, on. Sorry, I was going to ask you: Are were they marketing idiots or marketing geniuses? Well, the accidents happen, right? Yeah, no one will really know. I seriously doubt it was done intentionally, but you know, I you would have to think that after re hearing the story, some new executive might attempt something like this. But I, I'm pretty sure this was a pure accident back then. Anyway, uh, th this uh, uh, fiasco ultimately did change branding forever because it demonstrated that no extensive consumer research could reveal the deep emotional attachment people have to the original Coca-Cola, right? And so you could do all this consumer testing, but there's there's an emotion to purchasing and, uh, and people, they didn't get that until this. And that's why this is one of the big case studies that they still talk about in business schools today right that's wild are you a coke yeah. or a pepsi guy patrick i don't drink either actually but uh really if, but if yeah like i'll drink whichever one's You're a true canadian guy I, I, canadian I, there you guy. go I, I do just drink beer yeah. and uh, uh, but if i was it all depends on what they're serving because usually when you go somewhere they're they're serving either coke or pepsi right and so i tend not to um I tend not to. I'll just drink whatever if if I do, but I don't really so, like. So you're indifferent drinks. to either one because you just don't dislike them both. Yeah, I, I, I'm not. A, I'm not a pop guy. But anyway, let's. Uh, that's a different conversation. I'm a beer guy. Anyway, so. 
Let's move on. It's time to get uh, Taylor to jump on here. It's time for the WTF clip of the week. Hey, Taylor, how you doing, buddy? Uh, I am doing so good. As you guys know, I do not drink beer, and I am halfway through this beer, and I can tell you I love you all. <laughs> 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 like oh we got him drunk on a half a beer this yeah. is awesome this half is he's a cheap a, uh, he's a cheap drunk this is awesome it's a uh, i'll take yeah. you to the bar anytime that's uh, <laughs> it's so good it's so good i'm glowing right now and i can t- i don't know if it's the half beer talking but that was an amazing talking charts like that was i'm sitting i was enthralled it was really really good one of the best it's the so. booze it's the booze it, yes it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, beer, uh, yeah, the beer goggles on for the talking charts is what I was doing. It's, it's amazing what a beer does. Every chart yeah. just looks more bullish that way, right? <laughs> yeah. <That's, laughs> uh, all right. So, what do you got in store for us, buddy? Yeah. So, um, I'm sure some of you caught it. Uh, um, the St. Louis Fed president, James Bullard, uh, goes on CNBC this week. And you could have sworn that it was like a Tesla permable on there because, like, you know, no matter what she threw at him, she was asking him all these questions and it was just bouncing off like left and right, like straight, like <laughs> straight down the barrel, looking at the camera, just not flinching at all. And I was like, this guy is a pro. I don't know if you guys seen that, like Kobe Bryant, like doesn't flinch when you throw the, the ball at him or you fake him out. He just doesn't move. Yeah, that was uh, that was the Fed, uh, St. Louis Fed president, James Bullard. All right. So let's watch. St. Louis Fed President James Bullard joins us now. Let's start right there with how this resurgence of coronavirus cases and some of the rollbacks and reopening and the, the economic hit that might have and how it affects your, your current outlook and thinking about recovery right now. I'm still pretty optimistic in my base case about the recovery. Oh. It is but a scratch. A scratch? Your arm's off. No, it isn't. I've had worse. You liar! Come on, you pansy! You're, you're sounding a little bit more optimistic than, than some of the other members of the Federal Reserve. Are, are you saying that a V-shaped recovery is possible? Well, I think we're uh, tracking very well right now. Uh, what? Our friends in the forecasting community are, are trying to play out a repeat of 2007 to 2009 and the aftermath of that. Just a flesh wound. That was a very different shock and a very different situation. All right. We call it a draw. <laughs> that, Monty Python is one of my favorites, man. That was uh, well done. You know, but to me, Taylor, like uh, what I find so powerful about that is, is that when you're in a position, uh, especially a position that has some political element to it, you can only ever look at the uh, everything through a um, glass half full lens, right? And you have to always try to be optimistic and everything. And uh, this is why I, I love uh, that Monty Python clip to mash with there. It's like uh, uh, the the, the uh, dark night is is a, an optimist. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. It works. Per- it works perfect. And I mean, it's probably the beer talking saying that that was flawless, but I can pretty much do anything right now. <laughs> All right. Kev, what did you think? I thought it was great. I enjoyed it tremendously. I was busy uh, um, getting ready for the rest of the show, though, Patrick. So that's why I wasn't paying as much attention trying to let you uh, run it a little bit. <laughs> All right. So. Uh, one second, Let- Lena. Edit that out, okay? Just like, uh, just take it from here. <laughs> uh, sorry, I was just, just edit that whole section out when he says, "Kevin, what do you think?" I wasn't ready. Oh, I think we should just leave this in here, Kev. Okay, Everyone needs fine. to know that you're not fucking paying attention. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do the top th- top three things to watch next week. But we're gonna start off reviewing last week. So, Kev, uh, Powell Mnuchin. Yeah, there wasn't. Uh, it was no fireworks. No. Nothing so jobs really. numbers. Jobs numbers. Again, not that big a deal. There's just it just ended up yeah. being a summer. It's the market's figured it all out. And the Global PMIs? Flash, nothing. Like there's this is the problem with these top three right now the, is this it's the summer and nobody cares and no one just, gives a shit. Yeah, Nobody gives a shit. That should be you know, the number one thing on the top three things to watch. Nothing. No one gives a shit. No one gives a Nothing shit. matters. <laughs> Nothing matters. No economic numbers matter. Nothing. What, you know, whatever these uh, 
Mnuchin, Mnuchin or Powell say doesn't matter. It's just it's just summer and it just keeps going up. Stocks only go up. You know what? Uh, it's it's that old adage of uh, nobody cares till everybody cares, and then everyone always cares all at once. And uh, and right now, nobody cares. So we'll find out when that transitions, right? right. So, so what do we got for next week? For next week, I wanted to start off just uh, talking about these uh, bond yields, right? And uh, what's particularly interesting uh, to me about what we're seeing on the 10-year yield is is that in spite of what uh, were some pretty clearly rising commodity prices, you know, uh, actually, let's start off with a very quick rundown of some of these commodities, right? And so let's let's jump to what was what's happening in copper. And, And we obviously had a big, huge breakout in... Um, and lumber and a whole bunch of these other commodities have started going. But you know, see copper breaking those January highs, it's just been on fire. And uh, you would think that the natural course, which is that if you have a weak dollar and rising commodity prices, generally it starts to stir, uh, stir the animal spirits about uh, potential inflation surge. So you, wh- whether it's just transitory or not, they're, they're usually the, it starts to reflect in the yields that everyone's starting to, to see that. And yet uh, the 10-year treasury yield just uh, earlier this morning was trading at 56 basis points. Big recovery intraday, but very, very weak. And, uh, and so I'm trying to kind of reconcile what's going on here. Are we, are we seeing that the 10-year yields are advertising that uh, that uh, this this entire commodity surge is a, a nothing burger, and that there isn't going to be any short term inflationary uh, impulse, or or what's your take on all of this? Well, first of all, if uh, the ten year yield was a patient's cardiogram, we would have to check for a pulse. It's uh, the person might be dead. There's just one <laughs> blip in there. It has become amazingly stable. Unmoving, nothing is happening in bonds. It's amazing what happens when the Fed buys every uh, treasury bond that's not stapled down. Right. It's almost <laughs> it's almost as if they've they've pegged the yield there and it's become really boring that way. And you know, I, I don't know what to make out of it, Patrick, except to say that for yeah. now it doesn't seem to be it, it Markets are not reacting to fundamentals. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to be worried about either side. The yeah. bond market is just, just drifting around, and, and it's, just, it's boring. And, that's, and yeah. that's all there is to it. So I wouldn't read too much into it saying, oh, the, the bond market's asleep, or the bond market's telling you the stock market's about to collapse, or that the bond market's uh, a seller that these commodities will, uh, uh, you know, won't continue their rise. I think the bond market's just gone to sleep. And nobody's right. really doing anything there, and it's uh, this is what happens when the Fed intervenes in such a large way. Right, right. So uh, let's move on. So number two, we were going to talk about uh, the Bank of Canada and the ECB uh, with uh, the policy statements and everything coming out next week. Is this going to be just uh, more of the same summer doldrums? The market's not going to even react to this stuff. Like, what's your thinking? It might. They're not going to uh, do anything dramatic, so don't expect a, you know a change in policy. Having said that, maybe we start to get signs that some of these uh, central banks are thinking about easing up in terms of how much stimulus that they apply, and maybe they're starting to look at this economy doing better, and you'll start to get hints. So far, we have not seen any of those hints from the Federal Reserve. It'll be interesting to see if any other central banks take the mantra and say, you know, we could see this getting better over the coming uh, months and quarters, and maybe we have to think about withdrawing some of our easy, uh, some of our policy right. stimulus. All right, so let's leave this with number one, and it's in the spirit of that Netflix chart that we were showing and the Tesla chart, but the uh, really what we are seeing is that the FANGS index, I'm using here the um, NYC uh, FANG plus index futures, but we're really seeing an acceleration of that rise. Like this, this we've gone like full on parabolic on this advance to the upside. And one of the big questions that we have to watch this week how far can they take this? I mean, when things get into this bubble phase, it always is shocking how far they take it. I mean, using 1999 as the 
pinnacle example where they managed to double the NASDAQ, even though the Dow and the S&P were almost unchanged in that period, the NASDAQ went 100% back then. Now, I'm not saying that that's going to happen here, but it's always amazing to see how far they can run these things when they get this kind of momentum. Uh, uh, how, how far do you think they can do this? Or take this? I don't know, but it's, it's, it's a dangerous... Trying to guess the top is costs a lot of money, and... Uh... I would just stay out of the way as they as they as they continue to steamroll this upwards and it gets more accelerates even even greater. One of the things that I think will happen, Patrick, one of these days we're going to get um, some sort of move where let's just say like Tesla, Tesla will go up 20 percent and then it'll finish down 10 percent. And that'll yeah. be the sign that we're getting, you know, that that, that yes. the top will be in and it might it might occur just on its own. It might not even have uh, a catalyst. It might just right. be it like, actually doesn't o- always have one, right? Like it, yeah. it's 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 just when when it's being driven by liquidity to this magnitude, at some point gravity is the catalyst, right? It'll like just, there's a, there, the everyone price will just look goes around, so- right? Everyone will look around and just say, "Who am I going to sell it to now?" And there'll be nobody to sell it to. And I'm not predicting that, and I'm not saying you should go short expecting it. I'm personally waiting for that sort of action. I yeah. would rather sell one of these stocks that is in this parabolic phase on the lows as opposed to the highs. You know, and you know what drives me crazy about this is that, like, I was I was um, rolling calendared straddles and stuff like that in the market back in January, February, when volatility was low. It was a great way. Like, there's different strat- option strategies you could typically do to try to fade these types of moves. Problem today is we're still at elevated volatility levels, and it it it, it, it destroys the asymmetry of the trade. It makes it have a much worse payoff per- profile. Uh, it's actually hard with these higher volatility premiums to actually do it. I mean, you could just stick with a classic debit spread or something like that to to kind of express some of these trades. But it's not as easy as it was back in January, actually. Well, in January, don't forget, we had all those pension funds and everyone selling vol to stupid yeah. levels that were below re- realized. And uh, it was a free lunch for those that uh, were willing to take long to option positions. Yeah. But now all of a sudden, after everyone getting crushed, you're back to an environment where owning options is expensive and you have to look at ways of trying to mitigate that risk by, you know, I don't know, figuring out things to short on the other side or or just yeah. trading to straight delta. Yeah. All right. Well, that is Anyways, one second. Don't things. one second. Actually, wow. I was going to ask you, you, you made me say, when is this going to be over? What do you think? Is, when's it going to be over? Um, I think soon. What what one thing that now price level and time are two different forecasts. I, I I'm not going to make a call that this is the price level it's going to turn because in like you you know what was that old uh, saying that you talked about gold was it uh, uh, Jim Rogers where right. it, the last two days he missed fifty percent of the move. That's right. Like, he said uh, something. Like, he says I I, I I was I sold gold within two days of the high. Unfortunately, I was. 40% off the high because, you know, in those last two days, it went that fast. Right. And I, I think uh, from a time perspective, we're probably with, within weeks of a, a, of a pretty um, much of a, some sort of a mean reverting move. Let's not call it the next crash or something, but there, it's going to give back this parabolic rise, but it can still go much higher on the short term. So I don't want to make the price call, but from a time frame perspective, it could very well happen here in the month of July. That's my call. Oh, okay. Come on. You're right. going to give us so closer than that. What's your best guess? After OPEX, it's going to run for at least another week. Uh, okay. It'll, it'll be, uh, it'll, it'll be at least another week. Maybe we'll, it'll be in the, you know what? We'll it'll time with my vacations, right? Like we're, we're going, <laughs> we're all taking, we're all taking time off. So it's when we're not at the machines that shit hits the fan. That guaranteed, actually, that's actually what's going to happen. There we go. That that is a good that is a good prediction. I find as well sometimes in August that you get very liquid uh, circum trading environment and some strange thing can happen. Don't forget that the flash crash was in August, right? No. So you know what? This is the funny thing. So this is what's going to happen here, Kev. And what's going to happen is that last last uh, year. We took the time in the show to, for our summer vacations in August, and it right. screwed our vacations. So we said, shit, August is always fucking liquid. 
So we're going to move our vacation this year to July so that we're here for the liquid August price action. And the move's going to fucking happen in July. Okay. You're probably <laughs> right. You're probably right. So there you go, folks. <laughs> We're all going for the last two weeks of July, so there it is. That's when it's going to happen. The, the, after after OPEX, at the end of, uh, end of July, watch And all our listeners are going to want... By, by the way, oh, for all our listeners listening, we're going to run a couple sum, great summer specials throughout that period. But, uh, you know, everyone's going to be coming online. Where's that update of what's going on? And it's like they're going to be stuck listening to summer specials. It's uh, right. They're going to be pissed. Our they listeners be pissed. are going to be pissed. Like, when the crash gonna... happens while we're away. There you go. <laughs> Anyways, that's great. Top three things to watch next week. So All right, parting so, uh... wisdom. So one of my favorite traders is Bruce Kovner. And he says, place your stops at a point that, if reached, will reasonably indicate that the trade is wrong, not at a point determined primarily by the maximum dollar amount you're willing to lose. And I oh, thought this was great advice. Because a lot of people just, they, they arbitrarily say, I only want to lose X dollars. And they don't look Worst at the charts. Doing it. Right. Like maybe that maybe that X dollars happens to be within the, the range that is very likely to get hit. Like a, a perfect example. Forget Fibonacci's for a second. It is okay. very common, even Dow theory, that after the primary rise of a market, that the secondary reaction gives back half of the gain. Right. right? That's a very typical thing. So you, the price rises 10 bucks, you'll give back five. That's just, that's just classic technical behavior of the markets. So if you put a stop loss because of your max threshold, $3 below where that max price is, you're going to be fucking hit. Yeah. Or that you like might that, not necessarily, that's just, but it's, 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 it's not the right spot to put it in because there's a, the good right chance, there's a good chance that it'll hit within that. So therefore, yeah. the answer to that is to trade smaller so that you can trade it so you can put your stop loss at five and a half dollars. Right. Exactly. He, right. You know what? That Bruce guy is a uh, pretty smart He knows guy. something. Yeah, he's He knows a, he's one or two things for sure. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I think I might listen to him. I might too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's wrap this by you up. Okay, well, that's it for our main show this week. We appreciate you tuning in. We couldn't do this show without you. And I'd like to thank our guest, Tony Beck. Unbelievable. It's great having a legend in, in house and uh, talking to a fellow Canadian about the bank credit analysis. I really enjoyed it. It was really a dream come true for me. And if you like what we do over here at the Market Huddle, please share it with your friends. You never know. The bigger our following, the better chance we have at getting Davy Day Trader Portnoy on the show to give us a one bite huddle review. Everyone knows the rules. But before we get to the after show, here's where you can find us. You can listen to us on the Market Huddle on. Sorry, let's try that again. You can listen to The Market Huddle on all the networks, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Android Play, iTunes, and YouTube. A lot of people watch on YouTube and see all of our charts and visuals. And while you're there, please like and subscribe to get our latest content. Follow us on Twitter at The Market Huddle. We're on Twitter every day. Give Lena a shout out. And please, if you could, rate and review us on iTunes. It would help us out immensely. Patrick, where can they find you? You can find me at Patrick Ceresna on Twitter, as well as uh, you can find me at BigPictureTrading.com. Kev, where can they find you? So I'm at Kevin Muir, M-U-I-R, and you can check out my newsletter at TheMacroTourist.Substack.com. And listen, we can never have too many friends. Bear market, bull market. We're just happy to spend time together on this crazy ride. So thanks for tuning in. Now stick around for the after show. All right. Hey. That was people. fun. <laughs> the youngins. Where is everyone? <laughs> We're here. We're here. Okay. <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> yeah. Oh, Taylor's Taylor's hammered. Right He's hammered. Yeah, He's yeah, hammered. Yeah, yeah. Taylor, huh? Taylor, huh? Taylor's those, hammered. For those who don't know, Patrick, Patrick gave up drinking. Sorry, not Patrick. Taylor gave up <laughs> drinking. And then, and uh, you know, we basically... It felt left out. He, we shamed him into drinking with us. No, we did not shame him into drinking with us. Yes, we, we were did. actually very yes, concerned did. that he was taking up drinking on our account. <laughs> so um, we, we we checked with his wife. He said it was. She said it was okay, and he started to drink again. So so Taylor, how long since you've had a, a drink? Uh, you know, I stopped, like you know, just doing regular beers like uh, New Year's last year. So it's been almost, uh, I guess, eighteen oh. months. And then, uh, but so you, you know, have? I, do you have your? Do you have your eighteen month sober coin? No, <laughs> you have I mean, to like, get back now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know, we like go to we we'll go vacation in Mexico. We were actually the last flight. Like you know, we were the first people in the airport out of Mexico to be wearing masks. It was like late February, and uh, there in Mexico, I had a couple. Uh, 
whatever they are. <laughs> drinks. <laughs> so I wanted those oh, drinks. Yeah, oh yeah. Gosh. Te- tequila. <laughs> Te- tequila. Okay, let's <laughs> review this bad boy. Lena, why don't you get on and give us some sober w- words of wisdom here? <laughs> <laughs> um, I I didn't mind it. I don't I don't know if I particularly like it or dislike it. Oh, I would drink it if it's there. You, know, you <laughs> drink almost um, anything if it's there. Yeah. So true. so what are you giving um, it? I would give it a seven point two. Oh, that's pretty good. You're nice. It's drinkable. Yeah. It's just that I, I nothing was too you know it wasn't outstanding for me, but it's still drinkable. Okay, Taylor, what do yeah. you think? I know it's like your first beer in a while, so it's gonna yeah. be like a ten. Well, you know, I'm uh, I'm a huge fan of... It tastes so good. Of... It tastes so good on my <laughs> yeah. lips. It would yeah. it hit your lips. It's so yeah. good. Yeah. I mean, like, Let's I'm go a huge streaking. fan of, like, dry hop. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm licking the can right now. I'm all done, uh, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's over. I drank it. Uh, I was done and within about 10 minutes. But I'm a huge hop guy. Like, I love IPAs. I love anything hoppy. I had this one in the freezer for a bit. It's piping cold. Uh, so I would give this probably a 9.8 oh. what? for me. But, uh, you know, you got to remember, mine's kind the of first beer in 18 right? months. Relative. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Beer, beer goggles. But, but what you now have done is, is that when next week's beer yeah. is better, how do you yeah. go above 9.8? You got to lower your. Yeah, it's like Cordoy says. That's it. Amateur score. Amateur score. Amateur. That's a poor day. Well, listen. You know what? Welcome, welcome to this. You're allowed to make amateur mistakes when it's the first time doing it. That's right. That's right, Patrick. Okay, so Patrick, a pro. Here comes Patrick, the pro. What do you rate this? (laughs) I'm gonna give it a 7.9. I would totally drink this. I would. No, listen. I would. No, it's not that. I just. That's was my score. Sorry. Well, you know what? That's very unusual. I know it's very unusual for us to agree on a beer. You know what? It's it's not like you know what? I'll tell you right now. I don't know whether I would be regularly buying these, but I certainly would be drinking them if someone was giving them to me. Nice. So, yeah. so that's the that's the way I'd put it. It's it's a it's a good beer. Okay. Okay. Now, what are we going to talk about? We have a little bit of time here. <laughs> Lena, take it away. Lena, did you did you end up? Everybody's wa- drunk on their face. Lena, though, did we talked about? Did you end up watching the producers? No, I didn't. Kev, did you watch she, the producers? No. And Lena no never one. watches when you went and tell her to watch something. I'll watch something when you guys watch something I tell you to watch. That's How about that. The producers. That's one. Of, that's a, that's one of my. Uh, yeah, it's one of my f- favorite comedies. And so, like, I was like, wanted something to talk about that everyone else saw. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll nobody. watch. It, I'll watch it over the summer for sure. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the summer. Is that, it's a pretty long time frame. To, <laughs> yeah. I'll get to it. Like every, you know, now every week I'm gonna ask you just so our listeners know what defines summer to you. Oh, I, 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 you know what? I haven't seen this, but I do want to see this. So Patrick, I will commit to watching this. I've never seen this, but I actually think this is gonna be a great, great show. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So did you 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 watch it as well, Taryn? Oh no, no, guys. I just know that Mel Brooks is the bomb. I haven't seen it. I'm not watching it. What we should do, and I know we all don't want to do this, but what we should do is commit to watching all musicals this summer. We just watch musicals. Oh my god, no. my ears are bleeding. Yeah, just thinking about uh, it. you're 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 out. Forget it. I'm done. <laughs> I'll tell Jeez. you right now. I, I well, did you guys watch Hamilton? I watched no, five watched minutes. I watched the first not half, yet. and I was like, oh, I, 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 I usually like musicals. You know me, I'm a sap. And I, I didn't like it as much <laughs> as I thought I would. Maybe I went in with too high expectations. I, but I, I, I like... I like things like Phantom of the Opera. Like you know, I'm I I can I'm I'm just showing how old I am. Like I I like the kind of classic uh, musicals, but uh, all these modern ones, it's just I yeah. don't know. I don't I, I just it, I can't get into them. It's got it's got Patrick rap in likes, there. Yeah, yeah. Anything with Jack Lemmon, and you guys are just into. <laughs> A lot of people will get that joke. There shouldn't be anyone who doesn't get that joke. I don't get it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, Taylor's joining in the slurring club. Yeah, I know he is. I, I, I know. What's happening? <laughs> Guys, this Don't tell his wife. Yeah, okay. yeah do not. Ja- I have to Jack speak Lennon. kindly. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, a, I have a funny story to tell you that when you talk about old people like this, you know how there's that oh. line that when you, uh, you have your list of uh, celebrities oh, you're allowed yeah. to... Oh, my God. Uh, we, 
that's, yeah. it takes about a month of episodes for you to bring this topic. Up. I know, but anyways, <laughs> one time I was sitting there and I forever get flack for this from all my buddies because we were going through it, and I said I would definitely have Anne Margaret in her prime on there, and and they all said <laughs> Anne Margaret. That's like my grandmother, and so I'm forever known as the guy that chose Anne Margaret. You guys don't even know who Anne Margaret is. <laughs> no, I li- I do not know. Anne Margaret. I'm looking her up right now. now. <laughs> I'm searching it right now. <laughs> She's the one in the Elvis movies. Oh. Uh, okay. So t- oh, like you mean like uh, when she yeah. was like from those movies? But it was always a joke. Right so now. my buddies always give me a hard time. Like, Anne, Anne Margaret Anne Mar- Olsen, uh, born 1894. What? <laughs> no, it isn't. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> so you've got Anne Margaret and Lindsay Lohan on the same list. Is that? Yeah. Is that? I got right? a crazy oh list. I got a crazy list. Wow. That's a you're you're gonna have range. to expand it now to like uh, to maybe seven now because you can't keep that as just three. Yeah. But it's, it's, maybe your wife will let you expand it to uh, to a larger list. Well, yeah. <laughs> No, and as she's long as picking, she can expand she's her picking list, ones right? like uh, what is what is on her list. She likes that stupid guy in um, Channing Tatum. Yeah, that's right. We talked about this, right? Oh man, yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I know exactly. My condolences. <laughs> you know, when when Channing Tatum was on Saturday Night Live, and I, I saw it, I didn't know who he was. I was like, man, this athlete is doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> And then they were like, oh, no, this guy. And I was like, what? <laughs> hey, you can't criticize her for, you know, Channing Tatum when you've got Lindsay Lohan on your I know. I get it. Now. I understand. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I'm not criticizing. <laughs> you guys are the ones judging. Well, I'm yes. judging. You know, everybody, everybody gets one. And, like, you know, I think my wife gets, like, uh, you know, um, Sam Rockwell, let's say. That's who she gets. And then I get really? yeah, this this girl I work with at, at work. No, I'm just joking. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's, that's, that's a street joke. That's an old street joke. That's actually funny. Whoa, that was, a, that, was really... that was almost dangerous. So, yeah, yeah. So I was like, your wife. Is someone honestly, gonna tell him that that's picking... not cool? <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that's a good joke. We just didn't get it quick enough. Um, yeah. So, yeah. honest to God, Sam Rockwell's on your wife's list. Um, I don't know. Really? I actually don't know. I could ask her right now. She's in the other room, but she. No, she probably you know, not gonna Sam, like that. Sam Rockwell's the bomb. Like he's just a cool. I'm not. I wouldn't even be upset. Like oh. good for you. <laughs> 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 you know, the, when when because we've had this conversation before, and she'll be like, so uh, I'll be like, yeah, you know, who do we get? And she, and she's like, we don't get any. And I was like, well, what do you mean? She's like, I'm in because my wife's in in the industry of, of film and television. And she's like, I'm in the industry. Like, we could very well meet these people. And I'm like, I know. So, That's why we're talking about it. More the reason. <laughs> yeah. Be prepared. Yeah. When the moment happens. You never know. You never, you never know. know. You never know. You never know. Okay, so our job is to watch the producers, guys. Everyone do it. I'm going to do it. You guys all watch it. I'll watch it again. <laughs> Lena, we have to do it. it. You know what? I'll, I'll watch it just, just for fun. You, know, you know what's the we funny thing is you guys make fun of me for not watching all these movies, but some of these movies that I did watch, I ended up like watching like three times. Like, I don't know. I'm, I'm like, it, it's it's a stupid thing. Like, I've watched Austin Powers, uh, Gold Member, like five times. I, 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 it's <laughs> like, I... There's certain movies that when when, uh, when they're just good, it just it's like ones that just get recycled, right? Am I, I allowed to kid? watch yeah, I... Patrick? Am I allowed to watch the 2005 version of the producers? I don't know. Did you watch that, or do you watch it in the original, the '67 one? No, 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 no. The, the new one. Oh, so you didn't even watch the original? No, I don't even know the original. <laughs> there we go. Patrick's telling us. Something. Come on now. No, you got to watch the the, the one with the one with, with Uma uh, Thurman and everyone. Oh God, buddy! I thought you were giving me the original one. No. You mean with Matthew Broderick? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's, that's a remake. Yes, but it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll watch the wow. remake. You're me. recommending this the original? Conversation turned the wrong track. What? I thought that's what you guys were talking about. I thought like it's like it's like trying to say you want new Coke instead of the Coke Classic. 
<laughs> well, if you're if you're I gonna do. introduce someone to like a remake, you always start it off like, hey, you know, the original was really good, but the remake is even better. And then you're like, okay, I'll watch uh, the remake. I'm gonna say something but embarrassing. Like, I never, I never knew there was an original. To be honest, I won't lie. Uh, <laughs> I won't lie. I didn't. I thought that was the original. <laughs> okay, so we got to talk about the new Coke just briefly, um, because when we were doing this and I was looking up commercials, I stumbled upon the Coke, uh, the Pepsi commercial. That because uh, the Pepsi that had taken so much share, and it was what was the uh, supermodel's name, Patrick? Uh, uh, Cindy, Cindy Crawford. Cindy, Cindy Crawford. Crawford. <laughs> which is a great commercial. Google it. It's 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 a great commercial. It's funny. She comes out of a Lamborghini or some kind of crazy car. Funniest part though is I googled it while I was looking at it, and there's a new one with uh, what's the British guy that has the uh, talk show? Uh, he's kind of annoying. And he's chubby. Oh, it's British guy. And he yeah. sings. He sings. James Corden. Yeah, there's one with James Corden, and it, with uh, Cindy Crawford, and they come out of it, and he's like wearing a tank top, and his big, huge gut is sticking out there. It looks like he's carrying like a jack o' lantern in there, and like it's like it's just gross. And uh, anyways, you gotta watch it. All right, I'm gonna look it up. Yeah, James Corden. Yeah, and, I'll go watch it after Cindy, you tell me Cindy it's Crawford. gross. <laughs> okay, she looks good. He looks bad. <laughs> is she on the list? No, I'm not a big Cindy. Is it still a Pepsi uh, commercial, or is it? Was, it's, it a, no, it's a remake. It's a joke. Okay. So oh, go, it's go a watch. joke. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't know it's a joke. I was like, what? James <laughs> Cor- James Corden looks like a celebrity who has rich parents. You know, you're like, how'd this guy be a celebrity? You're like, oh, probably his parents. <laughs> is that? I like James Corden sometimes. And that's, so, I don't, are we into supposedly he's a real jerk. Yeah, he's supposed yeah. to be a real. He's a real jerk. Yeah, there's a there's a clip of him with like a James Patrick Stewart at some like awards ceremony, and yeah. it's just like it's a. I, I watch uh, cringe videos. I don't know if anyone else yeah. does this, but like social interactions that really make you cringe. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why I enjoy watching them. One of them, like one of the top hit on Reddit, is that clip of him and like James Patrick Stewart like battling on stage and as they're giving an award and it's really socially interesting to watch so recommend oh, that if you're a weirdo i'm, I'm gonna go well, i'm <laughs> signing up for that right away i'm gonna google yeah. it as we speak yeah, yeah. okay yeah. well that on I that note watch that on that note i'm the weirdo that has to watch this so i'm gonna <laughs> let you guys go so have a great weekend folks and we'll see you all uh, next week thanks for tuning in thanks everyone